Here we go. So now we're going to talk about antidysrhythmic uh, pharmacology. And to understand how antidysrhythmics work, or at least gain some perspective on how they work, we need to revisit an old topic, the um, action potential. And I believe that I talked about this already with you guys in, 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 during the ECG course uh, when I covered for Paul. Uh, so we're going to start there. And we're going to expand upon that a little bit. Um, so you guys remember when I drew the picture that looked like this? Yeah, you guys remember that? Mm -hmm. What 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 was this a picture of? The phases of the heart. No, uh, well, yeah, phases of um, uh, polarization and depolarization. Okay, sort of. Yeah. And what did it signify? Um, it was looking at. It's a graph, right? Is looking at the potential across the membrane of the myocyte over time. And we know that down here is more negative, right? Mm -hmm. Approximately negative, 80, 90 millivolts, whatever. The value is not that important. And then up here is more positive. And what I said was down here, where it was flat and negative, this is what we call the resting potential, right? Yeah. This is the resting potential of the cell resting potential and then what happened was um, this was also phase four right we call call this phase four resting potential and then what happened was when the cell depolarized what 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 comes into the cell what rushes into the cell sodium is the first thing to rush into the cell so during phase zero right here sodium ions rush into the cell and they make the cell more positive right i have positive charge rushing into the cell so it pushes it up and then here it drops down a little bit what happens during this drop or what we call phase one what's going on there Potassium, there you go. So during phase one, potassium is leaving the cell. So sodium rushes in during phase zero, and potassium leaves the cell during phase one. And if I have a positively charged ion leaving the cell, it's gonna make it more negative, so it drops down. But then it plateaus off here, and this plateau region is what we call phase three. And what happens here is calcium is rushing into the cell, and that offsets that potassium rushing out. And so it prevents it from moving down any further, and it kind of balances out, and so you have that plateau there. And then finally, what's the major thing that happens here uh, during let's see, zero, was, one, this is supposed to be two. Supposed to be phase two here. Nobody called me on that. And then phase three down here. Say that again? That was just calcium, right? Right, calcium is rushing in while potassium is rushing out, right? Mm -hmm. And they balance each other out, kind of plateaus. And then here in phase three, what's the major event that happens? The sodium leaves the cell. Well, this, yeah, the sodium's pumped out and the potassium is pumped back in. Okay. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Good? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I didn't tell you the whole story earlier because this is just what <clears throat> run-of-the-mill myocardial cells look like when they depolarize. These are what myocytes and hysperkinji cells look like when they depolarize. This is not what nodal tissue looks like. So this is not what the SA and the AV node looks like. The SA and the AV nodes depolarize a little differently. And they kind of look um, like this. And I'll draw it next to this, this little guy here for comparison. OK? 
okay? This is what it looks like when your nodal tissue, so we call this a non-nodal action potential, and this is nodal. Now, you can see this looks really different, doesn't it? What do you notice is going on here? What's so different here? Well, let's, let's start here. Let's start here at phase four. Is phase four different here than here? No. It does not appear to be. There's something subtle oh, going on. Is it going slightly up? Is that yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's going up slightly. We're here, it's flat, right? So what's going on here is the sodium channels are naturally just a little leaky. They allow just a little bit of sodium to flow into the cell. And then eventually, once enough sodium creeps into the cell, we reach what's called the threshold, and then the cell depolarizes. Why do you suppose we want to have these leaky sodium channels in nodal tissues? What's the importance of having this happen here? Well, what if you didn't have this? What if this? What if you did not have leaky sodium channels and it was just flat, just flat? What would happen? What would would be going on in the cell? Nothing. Nothing. It would basically stay in the resting state, right? And it wouldn't depolarize. It's these leaky sodium channels that allow for the automaticity. Remember we talked about the special properties of cells. This is what makes nodal tissue specifically, this is what gives it to automaticity. It has these naturally leaky sodium channels. And, and you know, 60 to 100 times a minute, they naturally reach their threshold and they depolarize, right? If you did not have those naturally leaky sodium channels, these cells would not be very effective as pacemakers. Does that kind of make sense what's going on there? You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why we see this gradual increase. The sodium just slowly leaks in and eventually enough sodium reaches what's called the threshold and that causes the entire cell to depolarize. Then it resets itself. And maybe I should draw it more like, more like this here and it does it all over again. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, interestingly enough, there are different electrolytes flowing in and out of the cell at different times in your nodal tissue. And this is very important to understand because it will help us understand how certain antidysrhythmics work in the ways they work in. So if we look at phase zero here, okay, this part here, phase zero, okay, generally we see that sodium, right? We see that sodium rushing into the cell. Well, in our nodal tissues, phase zero tends to be more calcium coming into the cell. Okay, tends to be a lot more calcium coming into the cell in phase zero versus sodium. Okay, that's very different in nodal tissues versus non-nodal tissues. You guys okay with that? What is the AD? The what? The AD. AP, action oh, potential AP. there. Yeah. Yeah. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah. Boom. All right. So uh, let's now move into talking about antidysrhythmics proper. As you might guess, our antidysrhythmic classes are generally categorized in how they affect the flow of ions in or out of the, of the tissues. Okay. And the traditional way of categorizing or classifying antidysrhythmics is a system known as the Von Williams classification. And the Von Williams classification contains four traditional classes. So we'll just review those classes uh, generally and then we'll go into a little more detail. So class one, a class one antidysrhythmic or antirhythmic agent is an agent that's 
primary mechanism of action revolves around blocking sodium channels. These are what we call sodium channel blockers. All right. So if you had to guess, are these agents going to be, um, are these agents going to affect nodal tissues or non-nodal tissues? Non They're going to affect non-nodal tissues more robustly, right? So because where in non-nodal tissues are they going to work primarily? Which phase? Zero. Phase zero, right? So this here, you know, maybe I'll just try to color code this. This here is where your class one agents are primarily going to work, phase zero. You guys cool with that? Yeah. And they're primarily going to have their action in more non-nodal tissues, right? So in the actual ventricular muscle tissues themselves versus the nodes. You guys okay with that? So if I had a problem with an arrhythmia that's coming from a node, would giving a sodium channel blocker necessarily be the best way to go? No. Probably not because the nodal tissues are not as sensitive okay, to sodium. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. There's a, this is just such a cool thing to talk about because there's so much depth and you can really begin to understand what's going on here. Okay, you guys cool with that? Class one, sodium channel blockers? Yes, sir. And so the, um, the, no, the nodal tissue isn't going to be affected? It will. Just not. It will be affected, just not nearly as much as your non-nodal tissues. And yeah. the non-nodal tissues is pretty much everything else other than the... The SA and AD nodes. Oh, yeah. 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 Cool. So those are class one agents. And let me, I'll select another color here. Class two agents. Class two agents are known as the beta blockers. Okay. Are known as the beta blockers. The beta blockers primarily work here in nodal tissues. And what the beta blockers do is, you see the slope of this, of phase four here? Mm -hmm. What beta blockers do is they make this slope flatter. They flatten that slope out. What happens when I flatten that slope out? What does that cause? So that causes those naturally leaky sodium channels to be a little less leaky, which means this, which means that these nodes are going to depolarize more frequently or less frequently? Less frequently. Less frequently. Does that make sense? Yeah. What, how beta blockers work? So beta blockers decrease the automaticity, in, in a sense, through nodal tissues. You guys okay with that? Yeah. And beta blockers do not have real significant effects in your non-nodal tissues. You guys okay with that? Because mm -hmm. you don't have those, those natural, or you don't have large concentrations of those naturally leaky sodium channels over here. So the majority of the effects of beta blockers tend to be in non-nodal, or nodal tissues, excuse me. You guys good with that? So you got sodium channel blockers, you got your beta blockers. Um, let me select another color here. Okay. Your class three agents, your class three agents, all right, are primarily referred to as your potassium channel blockers. Okay. And where do you suppose your class three agents are going to work? Which phase? Well, where do I have most of my potassium? Where is it more significant, I, I should say? Uh, phase one, yes, you do have some potassium moving into the cell, right? But does potassium, or moving out of the cell, excuse me. But let me ask you this question. Does potassium just naturally want to get out of the cell? No. no. Well, yeah, it, actually the sodium, the rush of sodium in does cause it to push out. But where is most of the potassium in the body? In or out of the cells? In the cells, most of it's in the cell, so let me ask you again. Does potassium naturally want to diffuse out of the cell? Yeah, it does. Because diffusion is from high concentration to low, right? If there's low concentration of potassium outside the body, 
there is a gradient that potassium wants to move. So, it's, it, so the way that I kind of look at it is potassium is just naturally kind of wanting to go through it with its gradient through those channels in phase one. But what happens in phase three is that potassium is actively transported. So it takes more work. There's more nuance here. So if I'm going to give a drug that's going to affect potassium channels, is it going to be more nuanced here or more nuanced here? Phase three. Phase three. And you guys would be correct that phase three, okay, is primarily where my potassium channel blockers work. Do I also have phase three in nodal tissues? Yeah. Yeah, I do have a phase three. So guess what? Potassium channels to vary, or um, yeah, potassium channel blockers to a varying degree are also going to have effects in nodal tissues. Um, the potassium channel blockers are somewhat unique in that they, they, they seem to affect tissues in both areas of the heart, um, probably more in the non-nodal tissues, but you still do have some nodal, um, some limited nodal effects as well. Are you guys okay there? Yeah. Okay, and then finally I have what's called uh, the class four agents, and if you guys read ahead, you'd know what are the class four agents. These are the calcium channel blockers, and maybe um, I'll just do this in black here. So class four are the calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers, or CCBs, we'll say. You guys cool with that? All right. And our calcium channel blockers are primarily going to work where? Nodal tissue or non-nodal tissue? Nodal tissue. Nodal tissue because where is calcium significant? Phase zero. Phase zero. And so what they're going to do is they are going to alter phase zero here in nodal tissues. So if I had a problem with non-nodal tissue, an arrhythmia coming from non-nodal tissue, would a calcium channel blocker be a really good agent for that patient? Probably not, huh? But if I had a problem, an arrhythmia coming from the node, right, would a calcium channel blocker perhaps be a better agent? Does, is that starting to make sense? And are you guys beginning to see, oh, so if I have a, just an arrhythmia that's coming from a certain area of the heart, <coughs> at least I know which class of drug might be a better choice. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we're starting to build that foundation. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about more specific drugs. You guys okay with that? So I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk about the sodium channel blockers in more specific detail. Now, if we can get through the sodium channel blockers, we'll be okay because the sodium channel blockers are the more, most com complicated because there are three subcategories of sodium channel blockers. Okay, There are three subcategories. We have cat subcategory one, we call 1A. 1B and 1C. Okay? So you have class 1A, 1B, and 1C. Okay? And these classes affect the sodium channels slightly differently. Okay? Um, and we'll talk about a little bit of the, the nuance to how they actually affect those uh, sodium channels. So uh, when you look at a sodium channel, let me see if I can find a color here. Um, so you have your sodium channel here. And I'll try to draw this the best that I can for you guys. It looks something like this. All right. All right. So imagine this is a cell membrane here. And this is your sodium channel. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. Now, a sodium channel has two different what we call gates. Okay, It has what's known as the M gate and the H gate. And let me select another color here. This little ball-looking thing here is what we call the H gate. 
And this little thing here is what we call the M gate. Now this is a sodium channel in its inactive or resting state. This is a resting sodium channel. You guys okay with that? Mm -hmm. So this would be a sodium channel right here, resting. You guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. What happens is when the sodium channel <clears throat> um, opens, and I'll draw it down here, okay? The H gate is already open. Can you guys see that? This, it's sticking down, it's already out of the way. It's not a problem. So the only thing that happens when it becomes active is the M gate opens up. And I'll draw that there. The M gate opens up and the H gate stays open. So this is a sodium channel that's active. So this is a sodium channel we see right here, right? The first part of phase zero. And then as all the sodium comes into the cell, okay, the sodium channel is going to go into its inactive state. It's gonna be like, okay, enough sodium in the cell, I need to get ready to reset myself. And so what's gonna happen is, okay, what's gonna happen is the H gate is gonna flop on over and it's going to block the hole here, okay? So this is the active state, and this is the inactive state. And then the inactive state is gonna occur up here as all the sodium gets into the cell, right? And then as I, and then as um, all the sodium gets pumped out of the cell, it'll go back into its resting state. You guys cool with that? So resting, active, inactive, back to resting. You guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. Now, the antidysrhythmics, our, our class one antidysrhythmics, tend to affect the sodium channel here in either its active or its inactive state. You guys okay with that? Sodium channel blockers don't tend to affect the sodium channel in its resting state, okay? Now, let's talk about how these things work in, in, a, in, in a little more detail. So the class 1A agents, okay, our class 1A agents are um, agents that are going to affect which area of the action potential, if you had to guess, which phase? What's that? Which phase? Um, the resting. The resting? Oh, uh, phase zero. Phase zero, right? Sorry. You guys good with that? Yeah. Okay. And these agents are going to delay, right? They're going to block the sodium as it flows through the channel in, in, in its active state primarily. Okay, in its active state primarily. And so what's going to happen is you're going to see, and I'll try to draw this the best I can, um, I'll draw a regular action potential. And then down below it, I'll draw what happens with the class 1A. The class 1A is going to block some of the sodium. So what's going to happen to the angle here? It's going to lower. It's going to, get it's going to be lowered, isn't it? It's going to decrease because it's going to take more time to depolarize. Do you guys cool with that? So it's going to go like this. You guys cool with that? Mm -hmm. And what has happened to the overall width of my action potential? It's increased, right? It is increased, it is widened. And this <coughs> distance right here, this distance here, is generally what we call the relative refractory period, right? The relative refractory period. Um, more refractory over here. And so what has happened to the duration of the refractory period? It's increased the duration of the refractory period. You guys okay with that? That's how class 1A agents work, okay? By decreasing the angle, right? They're blocking the flow of sodium. So it makes depolarization occur longer. So these are, um, are these gonna have chronotropic, ionotropic, or dromotropic effects primarily? Chronotropic, maybe a little bit, but what what drone yeah. going on? How about dromotropic? Right, decreasing 
conduction, right? It's taking longer for that action potential to conduct. So just looking here, we're having negative chromatropic effects. You guys cool with that? So the 1A agents, the, the big thing that they do is they increase the length of the, the action potential. There's really only one drug in this class that, that we see used, and even then it's not used that much. And it is a drug known as procanamide. Procanamide is a class 1A agent. Now, because I have lengthened, I've increased the length of the action potential, I've increased the length of the refractory period, what have I done to the QT interval? Have I increased or decreased the QT interval? Increased. Increased. Whenever I increase the QT interval, what does that make me more prone to developing? What life threatening dysrhythmia? Um, no, it's DMP. Say it. Come on, guys, say it. Torsades. Torsades, yeah. Torsade de point, right? Anytime I, that happens. So, a side effect, a major side effect of, of, of class 1A drugs is that they increase the QT interval, they make us prone to, more prone to developing torsades. Okay? The other thing to know about procanamide is that procanamide is metabolized into a different drug, or a, what we call an active metabolite known as N-acetylprocanamide, or we'll just call it NAPA. NAPA. N acetyl procanamide. And NAPA, in addition to the sodium blocking, also blocks potassium channels. And so it's kind of a double whammy because, as you guys are about to learn, potassium channel blockers also prolong the QT interval. So procanamide is kind of a double whammy, huh? Um, you guys okay with that? Good. All right, cool. Let's talk about the 1B agents. So that's 1A. 1B agents um, tend to be your, what we call your low potency agents. These have lower potency, okay? And the way that they affect the heart is a little different. Um, they don't lengthen the action potential. Okay, they don't lengthen it, so they don't affect sodium channels in their open state, do they? They tend to affect sodium channels more in their inactive state. So they don't affect sodium channels when you have lots of sodium flowing in. And in fact, the 1B agents may actually shorten the action potential a little bit. So let me ask you a question. Is there a higher risk or a lower risk of torsades when giving class 1B agents. There's a lower risk of torsades. The major class 1B agent that you guys need to be familiar with is lidocaine. Lidocaine is the major class 1B agent. You guys cool with that? All right. And then finally, there are class 1C agents. Um, the class 1C agents um, don't tend to affect the overall um, length of the action potential. They do um, make this angle a little shallower, but the overall length doesn't um, increase as much. Um, the class 1 uh, C agents, however, are very potent and they stay attached to the sodium channel for a long period of time. Okay, um, Much longer, certainly, than the class 1B. The 1B agents stay attached the least amount of time. Yeah, the 1C though, very high potency, they have a very slow, what we call association and dissociation rate. And these are pretty rare. We don't see these used a whole lot at all. And these include drugs like aflecanide and um, propofenone. I have never in um, my almost 20 years of, of being in healthcare ever seen these agents used. Um, I'm sure they're used somewhere in some cases, but very rarely have I. Or actually, I've never seen these agents used, uh, but still, I want to mention them. Okay, you guys okay there? 
So let's talk about these sodium channel blockers in um, a little more detail. Why would we administer a sodium channel blocker? What types of dysrhythmias would we be trying to treat with sodium channel blockers? Okay, dysrhythmia is coming from what area of the heart? Let's start there. What area of the heart? The picture I drew for you guys. From the nose? Oh, I see from the um, ventricles. Okay, well, let's, before we get the ventricles, let's make sure we're all okay with where, is it nodal or non-nodal tissue first? Non-nodal non -nodal tissue, okay. So we're not typically going to be administering these for nodal rhythms, right? So SVT, uh, PSVT, AFib, A flutter, probably not going to be giving a lot, although sometimes they use procanamide for that, but but we'll, we'll kind of keep it general here. Okay, so we're going to be using them to treat non-nodal dysrhythmias. And, and as someone had mentioned, these tend to be life-threatening ventricular dysrhythmias. Okay, that's where our sodium channel blockers come into play. So VTAC, VFib. Um, VTAC both with and without a pulse. Okay, these are the primary dysrhythmias that we treat with sodium channel blockers. You guys okay with that? Okay, cool. All right. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about procainamide and lidocaine dosing. Uh, we tend to use a little more lidocaine out in the field. Um, so, lidocaine, or uh, let's talk about procainamide first. Procainamide is a weird one. Um, the dosing for it is, uh, oh my, just keep, continue having camera issues. So procainamide, if we're going to give it, what you do is you give a loading dose, okay? And the typical loading dose for procainamide in a life-threatening dysrhythmia is gonna be about 50 milligrams per kilogram IV, okay? You hang it in a drip and you give it slow IVs. 50 milligrams per kilogram. You guys okay with that? Yeah. So procainamide, right up here. 50 milligrams per kilogram. You load them up and then you can start a maintenance drip at one to four milligrams per minute. You guys cool with that? Now, procainamide, because it affects the action potential so profoundly, there are two things that you want to monitor that tell you to stop the procainamide. The two things are, if the QRS duration increases by more than 50%, okay? So if your QRS is widened by more than 50%, all right, or you develop hypotension, your blood pressure drops. If any of those two things happen, you gotta stop the procainamide. The patient's had enough. You guys okay with that? Okay. That's really all I want to do with procainamide. Um, there are a few other little nuances with it. Um, again, it's not something you run into a whole lot. Um, would we ever want to give these drugs to patients that had heart blocks or junctional rhythms or ventricular escape rhythms, anything like that? What do you think? Never, never, yeah. You never give these drugs to patients that have some sort of backup or escape rhythm. Okay, that could be very lethal because these escape rhythms can sometimes come from these areas of the heart, right? And you could really compromise somebody. Um, so, uh, let's see here. With procanamide, obviously, if your patient has a long QT interval, you're probably gonna wanna stay away from procanamide it could make it longer and make them prone to torsades and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, let's talk about lidocaine. Uh, lidocaine is also used for ventricular dysrhythmias. It's not as potent necessarily as um, procainamide, but there's a good argument that it's probably a little safer in a lot of cases. So our standard dose for lidocaine is gonna be one to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram IV push. And you can give that every three to five minutes to a maximum of three milligrams per kilogram. 
And then once you've converted that patient, just like procainamide, you need to follow up with a, a drip. Um, and that's one to four milligrams per minute. You guys cool there? That makes sense. All right. One to four milligrams per minute. Uh, things to know about lidocaine. Your patient can develop lidocaine toxicity. Lidocaine toxicity tends to be neurological. Okay. So you tend to have tremors. That happens first. Your patient gets tremors. They are more prone to developing seizures. Okay. So if your patient starts developing tremors, um, they're on lidocaine, you're going to want to back that drip off or possibly stop the drip because they're becoming lidotoxic. You guys, you guys okay with that? Cool. All right. Um, that's, I think we're good there on um, our sodium channel blockers. I don't, there's a few other little notes that I had, but we don't need to go into those details at this point. Okay, um, let's talk real quick about uh, beta blockers. Yeah, we'll go through beta blockers, get you on a break, finish up after a break. Okay, so beta blockers, where do they work? Where do they work? Non-nodal tissue or no? Okay, yeah, nodal tissue, okay? Yeah, phase four of nodal tissue. So beta blockers, we tend to give these more for rate control, right? To control fast rates, mm -hmm. specifically fast rates that come from the nodes. So if somebody's in ventricular tachycardia, do you think a beta blocker is gonna be a great option? Yeah. Probably not, because VTAC comes from non-nodal tissue primarily, right? Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Now beta blockers, there are three types of beta blockers, okay? There are what we call your type, your, your first type, which are non-selective. These are non-selective. Your second type are selective. And then there's a third type, which uh, we call mixed alpha beta. Okay. Your non-selective beta blockers are beta blockers that block every beta receptor, okay? They block every beta receptor. The big one that we run into in the United States is propranolol. What kinds of patients do you think are gonna be at highest risk for side effects if we give non-selective beta blockers? You see a problem with them. Okay, think about beta 2 receptors. This will block beta 2 receptors. Where might that be important for you guys? What kinds of patients? COPD, there you go. Reactive airway disease, COPD, asthma. Because what do we give when these particular patients have problems? We give things like albuterol. What does albuterol do? It activates what? It activates beta-2 receptors, doesn't it? So if I have somebody that has bad asthma and they need their beta-2 receptors activated for some bronchodilation, but you just dumped a bunch of pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, propranolol or enderol into their system, you just blocked all those beta-2 receptors in their lungs. Is there gonna be a problem? Yeah, potentially, okay? So very important to consider consideration when it comes to selecting a beta blocker. The selective beta blockers, or what we call the cardio-selective beta blockers, tend to be more selective to the beta-1 receptor. Okay, so they're not as problematic in these patients with airway disease. Um, these tend to be the real common ones that we give. Okay, so these include things like uh, metoprolol, Esmolol. And what do you notice about the name of, of all your beta blockers? LOL, right? They all end in LOL. So you have got your lols there. Okay. Esmolol, propolol, and um, atenolol is another selective one. And these, um, with the exception of esmolol, esmolol can only be given as a drip but these others actually can come in oral formulations and we see patients take these at, at, at home as well. There is a mixed alpha and beta that I wanna just mention because it's fairly common and that is something known as labetalol. 
And labetalol, not only does it block beta receptors, but it blocks alpha receptors as well. Where are primarily alpha-1 receptors located? In your blood vessels, right? Okay, so this will cause some vasodilation. So this is very unique among beta blockers. Um, it's a very weak alpha. It's like it's like a, a seven to one, seven beta receptors to one alpha receptor. So it's a pretty weak alpha blocker, but it still does hit some alpha there. Okay. Um, these agents may be used to help manage blood pressure. Um, we'll talk about that because it's a very nuanced subject. You can do a lot of damage if you aggressively uh, try to drop somebody's pressure. Um, these can also be used to decrease heart rate as well. Occasionally, we will actually use these as adjunctive therapy in patients with chest pain as well. Because what these can do is these can decrease the heart rate, take some of the work off the heart, and it may help decrease some of that, that um, discomfort that the patient's having. You guys okay with that? What did you say the selectives are beta-1 or beta-2 selectives? Beta-1. Beta-1. These cardio-selectives. They're cardio-selectives. Um, I do want you guys to know the dose of metoprolol and atenolol and albedolol, okay? Because we tend to give those three more. Esmolol, like I said, is a drip. I would expect for you to just look it up. Um, that tends to be more for like SVT management and that kind of thing. Okay, so uh, let's talk about labetalol real quick. So labetalol, what we'll generally do is we'll start at 10 to 20 milligrams and we'll give it very slow IV. 10 to 20 milligrams, slow IV over about two minutes. And then what we do is we, we look for response and if our patient is not responding in about 10 minutes or so, we can repeat the labetalol, but you double the dose. So if you start off with 10 milligrams and there's no change, then you can double it to 20. 40, 80, et cetera. And you can go, you know, potentially as high as 150 to even 300 milligrams in some cases. Um, I actually had to use this uh, a couple of times. One, one time I remember real, real distinctly was um, on a patient in, um, well, I was actually living in Afghanistan, but um, I flew into Iraq to a city called Balad, and a guy had a, um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage and he had a very severe uh, blood pressure issue uh, during the flight. And this is about a six, seven hour flight one way to get him out of uh, Balad um, into uh, Dubai, a neuro hospital there. Um, he ended up developing, he had a really bad pneumonia and, and, and some other things going on with him. But uh, I ended up having to go through a bunch of labetalol, try to get his pressure down a little bit. Um, we ended up doing a labetalol drip and if you're gonna do a labetalol drip, basically what you'll do is you'll just draw up 200 milligrams and mix that in about 160 milliliters of saline. And the reason that's 160 milliliters is 200 uh, milligrams of labetalol is about 40 milliliters. So it ends up being 200 milligrams in 200 milliliters or a one milligram per milliliter concentration. It's a one-to-one -one concentration. That makes it really simple. And then you just administer, um, basically you start at about two to eight milligrams per minute and you can titrate it up from there. You guys cool with that? Sure. So that's labetalol, okay. Metoprolol and atenolol, these tend to be just a one, uh, just a, the, you don't tend to do drips with these. The dose on both of these is five milligrams. Very slow IV, over two to five minutes, okay. If you have to give another dose, okay, um, if you have to give another dose, um, you can do it with atenolol. You can give a second dose in about 10 minutes. With metoprolol, the general way that we give metoprolol is we give three doses of it. You give five milligrams, you give another five, and then you give a third five, and you, you give 15 uh, total. Uh, but you divide it in five milligram doses. That's a pretty standard way of giving What's the time between? What's that? What did you say the time between each dose? Two to five. Yeah, metoprolol, you actually give it over five minutes. So it's an even slower IV. So you're giving five, mil basically you're giving a milligram a minute, right? You mean very slow IV, and then you do your next five, and you do your next five. You guys cool with that? Okay.
Um, some things to know about beta blockers, obviously they're gonna decrease your heart rate, they're, they might decrease your blood pressure, right? So things you gotta look out for. Beta blockers also compromise your patient's ability to respond to stress, okay? So these can make it very difficult to assess your patient, that's why sample history is real important. Okay, we actually had a guy in um, Deming that uh, was on his bicycle, he got hit by a car, he had a massive pneumothorax, he had a tension pneumo. Um, and when we got him into the emergency room, he had a heart rate of about 70, okay? Both of his femurs are broken, he had a big uh, pneumothorax. Okay, is that what you'd expect to see in, in that type of patient? No, you'd expect to see tachycardia, right? He did not have tachycardia, so we were thinking, oh man, he must have broke his spine, right? He's a neurogenic shock. <coughs> okay. Finally, somebody looked at his med list and was like, hey, wait a minute. This guy takes Topolol XL every day, 50 milligrams, right? It's a very common drug, right? To uh, which is just a slow release metopolol. That was it, right? He was on a beta blocker and his heart just was not responding to that, that physiological, physiological stress. Beta blockers can also mask the initial signs of hypoglycemia. So what initially happens when you get hypoglycemic? You get a little anxious, okay, you get a little anxious. You get a little tachycardic, you get a little pale, you get a little diaphoretic, don't you? Beta blockers can blunt all of that, right? Because they block those, those beta-1 receptors. So your hypoglycemic patient may not look like someone who's classically hypoglycemic, okay? Some contraindications, if you have a patient with bronchospasm, okay, you would not want to give a beta blocker. And it's, it's tempting because you may have tachycardic patients, right? But if you have a patient with bronchospasm, um, you treat the bronchospasm, not, not necessarily the tachycardia, right? <coughs> because that's maybe what's causing the, the uh, tachycardia, but that's obviously a different issue. Trauma patients, probably not a good idea to give trauma patients beta blockers, right? Um, what about patients in cardiogenic shock? Probably not a good idea to give something that depresses the, uh, the nodes, right, to somebody whose heart is completely failing. Mm -hmm. um, Additionally, it may, may not be a good idea to give beta blockers for acute, uh, acute exacerbation of CHF. That might be a bad thing. Um, why? Um, well, we think uh, the possible reason why is if somebody's heart is failing, what is one way the heart can increase cardiac output if, if the contractility isn't good? So if stroke volume is going down, what will it have to increase? The rate. So decreasing somebody's heart rate in, in acute failure may um, block their ability to maintain any cardiac output, which would be a bad thing. Um, so chronic management, managing CHF chronically, we see patients on beta blockers, but in the acute phase where they're decompensated and they're critically ill, you probably wanna stay away from beta blockers. Okay, you guys good with that? Mm -hmm. um, Okie dokie, I actually have a few minutes. I'm going to just breeze right on through potassium channel blockers simply because you're already really familiar with, with them. There's really only one potassium channel blocker that we run into in the United States that you guys run into, and that is you guys have been giving loads of it in your, in your mega code simulations. Giving loads of it. Hmm? Amiodarone. Yeah, amiodarone. There's another one, I believe it's ibutylide, uh, but again, we don't run into it. So uh, potassium channel blockers are primarily, primarily going to work where? Phase three, right? And we can see this in both nodal and uh, both nodal and non-nodal tissues, although there are significant effects are happening here in the non-nodal tissues. So what they're going to do is they're actually going to prolong phase three. So are they gonna increase or decrease the duration of that action potential? Increase it, so what are they gonna do the QT interval? Increase it, so our risk of torsades is gonna go up or down if we give a potassium channel blocker. It's gonna go up, it's a lot like the class 1A agent. I'm not gonna talk about dosing with amiodarone because 
You guys have been giving loads of it. You should know there are two ways that it gets dosed, right? There's a cardiac arrest dose and then there's a dose not cardiac arrest, right? Because we can give this, we can give amiodarone to patients that have tachycardias, right? We can even potentially use amiodarone to treat patients that have what? Yeah. Things like SVT, AFib, a flutter with RVR, those kinds of things, because we do see some, some nodal stuff going on there as well. Okay, um, mix. you guys should remember how to mix an amiodarone drip as well. You remember that? Because you wanna give what? You wanna give a thousand milligrams over 24 hours, right? So you mix a thousand milligrams in 500 milliliters, right? Mix 1,000 milligrams amiodarone, 500 milliliters, and um, you give what? 360 of that over the first six hours, and then the rest, the 540 over the next 18 hours, right? And for the first six hours, you run it at 30 milliliters per hour, and then eight for the next following 18, you run it at 15. So it's a pretty nuanced medication, but it's one that you actually run into so anyway, that was just a review. Uh, same, pretty much the same contraindications um, as your sodium channel blockers. You know, if you have heart blocks, escape rhythms, cardiogenic shock, those kinds of things, amiodarone probably not gonna be a good idea. Um, amiodarone has many side effects though. I just breezed through those real quick because you guys should be familiar with them. Um, a long-term side effect is pulmonary fibrosis. Okay, so it can take your lungs out. Obviously, it can cause hypotension, bradycardia, torsades. You guys know that. Um, the half-life, is it long or short on amiodarone? Short, long. Very long, incredibly long. Months. Yeah, months. Um, it is hepatotoxic as well. Well, a lot of drugs are, but it's, it's particularly hepatotoxic. And it can interact with your thyroid and can actually cause thyroid disorders. Um, in addition to that, amiodarone interacts with multiple medications. You'd want to be careful about giving amiodarone with, with any medication that prolongs a QT interval. Okay, so if you give somebody, let's see, promethazine, for example, for their nausea, all right, you got them on EKG, you give them promethazine, their QT interval gets a little prolonged because we know that is a, a, an expected side effect of a, of a phenothiazine. Um, and then for whatever reason you were thinking about giving amiodarone, you'd want to think very carefully about that. So you can see just how complicated this drug business is as a paramedic. It's a lot more complicated than you could ever imagine. Um, how about I get you guys out on a break, and then I'll see you back. What is it? Is it 11? Going on 11? Yeah. All right, I'll see you guys back at 11. Uh, we'll talk about the um, calcium channel blockers and the miscellaneous agents um, and then get you guys to lunch.